everybody. Or shall I say, hey, pilgrims, hey, skeptics, hey, dreamers, hey, gangsters of love. <laughs> I couldn't wait to say that. What if I told you that how you complete one particular sentence can transform everything in your life for the better? You'd say, sign me up, right? What's the sentence? I'll get to that. As a writer, my life has always been about words, beginning with some that were spoken even before I was born. It is 1968. By this point, my mother had endured at least five miscarriages, several of them late term. She is pregnant again and cannot bear to go through that heartache one more time. So she decides to end the pregnancy and goes to see the woman who took care of such things. The woman who lived in the shack by the moonlit cotton field. When Mama pulled up, the woman was standing on the porch as if expecting her. As Mama approached, the woman sized her up one end and down the other before looking her dead in the eye. Ma'am, I ain't taking this baby, so just keep your money. Mama was desperate and begged for her help. No, ma'am. The Lord says this one's going to be fine. This child has a purpose in life. Can't take this one. Despite the blessing of those words, childhood brought a torrent of curses. The hardcore drinking of my parents, their savage physical fights, a nervous breakdown, and plenty more. When home life would hit rock bottom, stories, stories would pluck me from the pit and deliver me to wondrous worlds where families were stable and there was no shame. Over and over again, reading and writing saved me. After my parents' divorce, my father became my rock. While my beautiful mama continued her self-destructive habits, I drew closer and closer to him. In every photo, I'm glued to his side. He was my alpha and omega, everything. Then, in my 17th year, he had a heart attack in front of me and was gone. I felt I had nothing left in this world except for my old friend's words. I wrote down my feelings and realized that I had a decision to make that would set the course for my life. I could remain afraid and obliterated by the pain, or as I wrote in my notebook, I am going to live. Fast forward to college. I'm about to graduate, and I want to be a writer and a literature professor. I need to get letters of recommendation for grad school. I head, head over to pick up the letter I'm most psyched about, the one from the professor I absolutely idolized and worshipped. Now, keep in mind, these letters had to remain sealed in order to be accepted, so you couldn't open them to see what they contained. So picture this, y'all. I'm biking home. I go biking home with the letter in my backpack, okay? The wind is at my back. The scent of magnolias is in the air. And my future as a writer, hello, hello over there, hello. <laughs> my future as a writer is boundless until I am hit with something that feels like a sucker punch. Something is wrong, feels wrong, way wrong. I pull over break the seal on the letter, and I read these words. Loretta Hannon is a mediocre writer. I am devastated. But worse than that, I believe him for 15 years. In accepting that one sentence, I absolutely rejected my true calling, violated my dream of being a writer, dismissed the destiny, the destiny, y'all, prescribed in the sacred contract made while I was in my mother's belly. So I buried that dream, decided writing would just have to be a hobby, and went on with life. 
Yet here's the best part. Your purpose never abandons you no matter how hard you try to push it down. Because when you choose to believe a lie about your very soul, your calling will not leave you alone. What does it look like? With me, I had headaches and recurring nightmares about expelling gruesome things from my mouth, such as my own intestines or gasoline that I was drowning in and trying to purge. Now, I'm no interpreter of dreams, y'all, but do you think the message was that I had something to get out and onto the page? Mostly, though, when this happens to you, you just have a sense that something is unsettled or incomplete in your life. And that is when what I call the stirrings begin. They're like arrows of light that puncture the membrane of the false self you've bought into. They urge you to take a step in the direction of your purpose, even if you're doubtful or downright terrified. I was both. I couldn't even refer to myself as a writer at that point. Yet, I submitted a story to Georgia Public Radio. They said yes. Wow, they must be hard up for material, I think. Or maybe I hoodwinked somebody. I don't know what happened, okay? The stirrings resurfaced five years later to such an extent that they're driving me nuts, okay? So just to get them off my back, I submit a story to National Public Radio. They said yes. What? And I thought... It must be a fluke. I'm still a crappy writer. I know what it is. They just like the sound of my southern accent. I know I sound like cornbread and collard greens, y'all. I know that. And let me just say, those are some good slow-cooked collard greens and some fried crispy cornbread with the lacy edges. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But NPR continued to say yes while I kept saying no to who I was. Then an email arrives from someone claiming to be a literary agent. She's heard me on the radio and might want to represent me. Okay, whatever. We set up a time to talk. Well, yeah, right. Like something's going to come of this. This is how the actual phone call went, y'all. Loretta, do you have a book? Sure do. Well, can you uh, go ahead and send that to me? Well, I haven't started it yet, (laughs) but I will. Finally, I said yes. I recognized in her question that my calling had just picked up the phone and called me, y'all. I was missing all the other signs. God knows, right? I had to at least try. After the phone call, I wrote the following words of staggering, staggering empowerment. I am not the worst writer in the world. (laughs) Not the most affirming statement, but it signaled the sea change that had been rumbling, roiling underneath on the inside. And this is entirely an inside job. It's the power of I am. From I am going to live, to I'm a mediocre writer, to I am not the worst writer, to I am an author, teacher, and mentor to other writers, and to those just seeking clarity or insight into their purpose, are those needing more joy and peace. It's not magic. We do it with words and writing. They come to me or I go to them in prisons, youth detention centers, accountability courts, public housing. Sacred contracts are everywhere. So the words that follow, I am, are very, very important things. They can be your your sacrament or they can be your undoing. I want to give you a real simple everyday example. If you say, I am miserable today, you will be. You'll transmit that misery to others and you'll attract more of it because you set the plan for today to suck. And so it does. But if you reframe it, rewrite it, you can say, I am going to push through today because I am resilient and capable of joy, shouting joy. 
even in the midst of this storm? So it will be. Going back to the idea of the words that follow your I am and how they can be your undoing or your sacrament, think about this. What if Norma Jean Mortensen had never said, I am Marilyn Monroe? Or what if my beautiful mama had not eventually said, I am never going to drink again? The power of words and the stories we claim is so big it makes the atom bomb look like a firecracker, a wet firecracker at that. As poet Muriel Rukeyser said, the universe is made of stories, not of atoms. I think one day science will catch up to this. Think about it. Everything is held together by stories. It's an interesting thing when you look at how every little thing really is held together by stories. From our reality right now, as we connect in the flicker of this instant, it's already gone, all the way to our immortality. After we ditch this old bundle of bones and blood vessels, we can live on and on, as long as words are spoken or written about us. Now, I'd like to make this much more personal and ask you to do three things. Number one, what does your I am statement look like? Think about that for a moment, and I'd like for you to close your eyes and compose your I am sentence. And I want you to go with whatever comes to your mind first, and please open your eyes once you have it. Number two, what words said about you at any time in your life, any time, need to be deleted forever, forever, forever. It doesn't matter who it came from. Identify, identify those vile, venomous, nauseating, no good strings of letters that have breached your sacred contract. I don't even know you, but I'm mad at those words for you. Be done with them. Number three, now that you have banished those wretched words, what will you replace them with? This is big, and I want you to aim high. I want you to think like the white queen in Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass, who allowed herself to believe as many as six, six impossible things. This is your rewrite. And it is the glorious, shimmering thing. It proves that you can change your story. Tonight, in the morning, a year from now. No expiration date, because it's your birthright. You are already designed for restoration. Hardwired to be what you've been all along. You're not recreating yourself. You are remembering. You're not getting to some new place. You're returning home. You have been given the gift of this life, just as I was on that lonely, desolate night in 1968. If things had gone differently, I could have been buried alongside the hundreds of others there by the cotton field. You too have won the same jackpot. What will you do with it? What is stirring in you? What rewrite is needed? And finally, in the book of your life, how does the story end? As you think it, speak it, write it. So shall it be. It's not magic. We do it with words. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Three more words just came to me just to tell you I love y'all.